you are a Christian, you are a masterpiece in the making. You, you see, when God sees you, he sees not just who you are now, but he sees who he is making you to be. You're a masterpiece in the making. He's not done with you yet, right? Praise the Lord for that. If you're a Christian, if you put your faith in Jesus, and he is making you into the person that he desires you to be. Okay, but it's not just that. When God saved you, he had good works in mind for you to walk in. Uh, to put it another way, he had ministry that he put right in front of you that he wants you to walk in. Uh, but even more than that, he has gifted you by his spirit in order to walk in the ministry that he's put in front of you. And that's what we're talking about uh, for the next month, last week and the next month that we have been gifted to serve. And today we're talking about the very best way because you see God has gifted us to serve that we may be unleashed into the ministry that he's put in front of us. So let's, where do we get that from? Go ahead and turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to do a little bit of review about, okay, all those things that pastor just said. Okay, where did he get those? We're going to look in the scriptures a little bit for what that is. uh, Do a little bit of review, kind of fly over the spiritual gifts real quick. And then we're going to zoom in on the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. In Ephesians, Paul says this, chapter 2 verse 1. He says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdoms of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature, following its desires and thoughts. And like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. This is who we used to be. And if you have not put your faith in Jesus, this is your identity. This is who you are. You see, Scripture is quite clear that the wages of sin is death. The payment that we receive when we say, do, and think anything that's against God's perfect standard or we fail to do the right thing. When we sin, we earn death because sin separates us from God who's the author and sustainer of life. This is what we used to be. This is us without Christ. This is the world without Christ right now. And out of love, I say to you, if you are with Christ, this is you today an object of wrath. Now, God's wrath is not capricious, okay? He's not like the gods and goddesses of the Greeks or the Romans that you do one little thing to tick them off and he's like, I'm just, I've had it. God, in his nature, is love. And in his nature, he is just. He is loving and gracious and kind and compassionate. He is a God who forgives sin, wickedness, and rebellion. And he is a God who, who punishes sin. There's not a contradiction between God's love and God's justice. If God wasn't just, if right wasn't right and wrong wasn't wrong and we could do whatever, the world would be in shambles, right? And so God does have a just, righteous wrath against sin. Sin will be punished. And we're going to get to later when we take communion, we see that we see the the justice of God that sin is punished was poured out, that wrath of God was poured out on Jesus. And so if you put your faith in Jesus, you are no longer an object of wrath because Jesus took that righteous wrath of God towards sin, that punishment. He took it all. And what's left is the grace and love and mercy of God. So this is who we were. We were objects of wrath, but we always got to get on the right side of the butt in Scripture, right? But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy. We were dead. He made us alive in Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it's by God's grace that we've been saved. And God raised us up with Christ. He seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. That grace is this idea of this leaning out in favor and love that God has and it's completely undeserved. You can't merit it. And in fact, it's given in defiance of your demerit, of my demerit. That's what God's grace is. And the outcome of that grace is when we, when we put our faith in Jesus, he did this in order that in the coming ages, he, God, might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in the kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it's by grace that we're saved through faith. God's grace poured out to us and us being persuaded that we need a savior and that Jesus is a sufficient savior and that God's grace and forgiveness and love through Jesus' death is enough. And we're persuaded and we sit in that chair, so to speak. It's not from ourselves. It's not. It's the gift of God. It's not by work, so no one can boast. And then it says this, for we are God's workmanship. We are God's masterpiece. 
where his poem, okay, this is a word that would be used for someone who was sculpting something or painting something or a poem that somebody was writing. That those that have put their faith in Jesus, you are a masterpiece in the making. We've been created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared when? What does it say up there? What was that? In advance. Yeah, the answer's right there. God prepared in advance for us to do. God, when he saved you, when you were created in Christ Jesus, had ministry that he put in front of you. God knows the gifts and talents that you have, okay? Like in your natural ability. God knows your personality. And when you put your faith in Jesus, the spirit came in, cleansed you, regenerated you, saved you, and brought gifts, a gift mix for you to use to walk in that ministry. That's where this comes from. Now, why is this so important? I think I'm getting ahead of my notes, but I want to make sure we get it right here. As your pastor, I want you to know what part of the body you play. As your pastor, I want you to know, I still got my paintbrushes and stuff up here, okay? I want you to know, has God made you to be a roller or has he made you to be a a brush like this that does the cutting in? And I don't know if I still have this tiny one in here because I found one laying on the floor in my car. I'm like, how did that get here? Or the really tiny brush that you use to do really detailed work. How has God made you? Because how he has made you was on purpose and how he has gifted you was on purpose for the ministry that he has for you. And so as your pastor, I want you to know your gifts. I want you to be equipped for ministry for a couple reasons. When you know how you've been equipped, when you know how you've been gifted, it gives you direction and purpose in your life. You see the way that God has made you, wired you, and gifted you. And it begins to open up doors to see the ministry he has for you. And in some ways, it may close other doors because you're not gifted in that way. So there's direction and purpose, and there's a freedom for you to be you. You don't have to be like me, okay? Please don't be like me, okay? We don't need everybody up here talking all at the same time. That's why Paul said, hey, their church service needs to be orderly, okay? Don't all talk at the same time, right? We all have different gifts to play. There's an interdependence in the body. Who has God made you to be? It's important because when you walk in your gifts, there is the joy that comes from when you see how your work is impacting other people in big ways and in small ways. And then also there is this accountability. Like we're going to stand before God as Christians. Uh, We're going to stand before Christ in judgment. And not the judgment of, did you do good enough to get into heaven or not, okay? Because none of us would pass that, right? And that's not how Christians get into heaven. That's not how anybody gets into heaven. Not how good you are. Did you trust in Jesus Christ to save you? Yes. Now, what did you do with what I gave you? Your time, your natural abilities, your talents, your relationships, your spiritual gifts. What rewards are in store for you to have because of how, how you were as my servant? And I don't want us to get to that place and be like, oh, could you go over those spiritual gift things again? I don't, I didn't quite get it. You see, God has gifted you to serve and he has unleashed you for ministry. So let's look a little bit um, for Ephesians chapter four. We're still doing just a little bit of review, okay? I made the slide super colorful because we got some things to talk about, okay? Can you guys see that okay in the back? Is that good there? Can you still read it? I always like to make sure when I use new colors that we can use, it works. Does it work back there? Good thumbs up. Okay, so in Ephesians, so skipping down a couple chapters, Paul, and we read this last week. It was he, it was Christ who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. Why? Why did he give some of those gifts Then the early church were used there as, as leadership and some of them are still operating today? Okay, I circled it, okay? That word right there, too. When we're reading scripture, little words like that can be really important because we go, why did he give it? Well, in order that, or to do what? God gave these leadership gifts in the church, not so that the leaders would do everything, but to prepare or equip God's people for works of service. I want to see you guys more prepared and more equipped. And it'd be like what Paul would say. He says, this is, you're doing this awesome. Keep doing it. Do it even more. I want to come alongside you to help you see how you're gifted and wired so that God can use me and my gift as a pastor teacher to help equip you for works of service. Why? Okay, it says, so that. Why does God give gifts to the church? So that the body of Christ may be built up. When you walk in your gift, the body of Christ is edified and built up. It's one of the ways, like we said last week, that as you walk in your gift, it's one of the ways that God uses to grow and shape you. But it's also a way that as you walk in your gift, God uses that to grow and shape and make all of us more and more into Christ. 
So it, it builds up the body, excuse me. And then it says, until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son and God. As we walk together in the diversity of our gifts, unified together, interdependent, it helps bring unity in faith and knowledge of Jesus Christ, unity around Christ. And also we become mature, okay? And that maturity shows up as attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. We become more like Christ. Continuing on. Then we'll no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head. That's Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament. Okay, if you have your Bibles open or you're on the Bible app and, and, and you're allowed to write in your Bible, okay, like you can underline that. Every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Every supporting ligament, each part. Everybody brings something to the table. Young, old, in between, Whatever your mental, emotional, physical capacities are right now, you bring something to the table. Walking in ministry is not something we ever really retire from. It may change. You may not physically be able to do the same things that you could in the past. You may not be in the same season of life or location to do something, but your gift can show up in different avenues to build up and edify the body. And so I encourage you to seek out, God, what is that for me now in this season of my life? So we unpacked a little bit of this, but I just want to give a little bit of summary. What we just went through, the spiritual gifts. Here's some basic overall things about them straight from that last scripture, okay? So they are for the building up of the body. They're given to encourage the body, to serve one another, okay? Their goal of it is unity around Jesus. So they're to build up the body to help unify us around Jesus. And they result in, as we walk in it together, the result hopefully is maturity, Christ-likeness, and clarity and stability. We know what we're called. We know the truth. We walk in it. We're not blown this way or that way. And they work as each part does its work in love. So that's a little bit of a summary of what we learned from spiritual gifts in Ephesians chapter 4. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 4. And this is, I love this section of scripture, okay? Um, Because you will see When we study through the spiritual gift passages, they're not all the same. There's not one exhaustive list of spiritual gifts, okay? And so you'll hear a lot of different teachings about spiritual gifts. And what my hope and my prayer is, is that as we go through this, that this will be a practical way for you to look at it, okay? Um, That will help you understand how you're gifted and how you can walk in that. But if we look through all these different passages, which we will... They don't all have the same list. They're not all the same. Peter's is the simplest, and that's why I love it, okay? And here, you'll see why it's so simple, okay? 1 Peter chapter 4, <clears throat> 7 through 11. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. And then he says this. Each one should use whatever gift he has received. Why? How? To serve others. So he says, hey, whatever gift you have, use it to serve others. Use it faithfully administrating God's gift in its various forms. And then he says, he gives two kinds of gifts. That's all. There's two kinds of gifts. There's speaking gifts and there's doing gifts. Peter makes it really simple, okay? His list is just two. If anybody speaks... He should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides so that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ to him be the glory and power forever and ever. So again, Peter, his list is short. Speaking gifts, serving gifts. And if you speak, realize it's God, it's God's words. Speak as if it's from him with his power. And when you serve, do it with the strength that God provides. So what do we learn about spiritual gifts from this uh, this package? This passage. Okay? The ones in green, those are the new ones. Given that we may serve others, right? To build up the body. See how there's the, they they relate together, right? For the common good, to build up the body, to serve one another. The result is glory and praise to God in Christ Jesus. And power is in there too. And then... 
the gifts are empowered by God. Peter says, if you have a speaking gift, speak as if it's the very words of God. If you have a serving gift, serve with the strength that God provides. The gifts are given by God, by his spirit, how he desires, how he determines, and they have his power behind it. So yes, like we talked about last week, there is an importance of discovering our gift and practicing it. The more you walk in your gift, the more comfortable you'll be in that, okay? But the spiritual gifts that we have, even though we talk about them kind of as paintbrushes or something like that, they're not just like tools we pull out of our tool belt. Like, oh, time to talk. Spiritual gift of talking. We don't know, okay? They're spirit-given. They're spirit-enabled. And so if we want to grow in our gifts, yes, we do want to practice, but it comes from living the life in connection with God's spirit. That's how your gift is going to be cultivated. So a little bit just of, we kind of flew over those two smaller passages about the spiritual gifts. And, and, and again, why is this so important? I want you to know the way that God has gifted you because it will give you direction and purpose in your life. Freedom to be who you were made to be. There'll be joy as you see how God is using you to impact the lives of others. And there's an accountability thing. I want when you stand before God that not only does he say, well done, good and faithful servant, come and enter in, but, but I, want him to, I want him to show the ministry in the ways that he used you because you were equipped. So I want to see you equipped. And I want to do what I can as your pastor to help you be equipped and to help you see where you can put your uh, gifts to work. And it's not just about ministry here within the church or even outreach events of the church. You see, we're called to be a loving, growing, going people, right? And that means that some of the ministry that we do is, is not necessarily explicitly connected to Skiff Lake Bible Church. Because when we live the mission life, missionary life in our homes and our families and schools and work, your gifting that God has given you is also for ministry in those places. And so I want to see you equipped to be able to walk in that. And it works as each part does its role in love. Now, if you can go ahead and turn to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're going to be in this book for the rest of the sermon. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14, okay? Three chapters devoted to spiritual gifts, okay? This is the longest passage in Scripture that deals with spiritual gifts. Now, it starts out with now about spiritual gifts, or in the Greek, it literally is now about spiritual things. Brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant, okay? So Paul is saying, look, about spiritual gifts, Corinthians, I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to be uninformed. Now, apparently from the context here of the scripture, the spiritual gifts were in operation in the Corinthian church. But they needed a lot of help because they also seemed to be misusing them and doing them in the wrong way so much that Paul had to correct them. So we get three chapters of spiritual gifts and he says they're, they're operating in them. They're, they're working. God's working in them, but you're doing it wrong. And I, want, I don't want you to be ignorant, okay? So as we read this, we're reading kind of over Paul's letter as he's writing to the Corinthians more than likely in response to some questions they have. Okay, because he's like now about spiritual gifts and then later on he'll be like now about the church service now about the resurrection from the dead. So it's like they had questions for him, which we don't know exactly what they were. And he's writing to them the responses, okay, to that Corinthian church in their place. And so we want to get some of what he's saying and what does this mean for us? Today we're talking about the very best way. So let's dig into scripture a bit. Now, about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant or uninformed. You know that when you were pagan, somehow or others, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So you see, the Corinthians, before they became Christians, they were pagans. And so Paul's like, you understand the spiritual realm because you are worshiping demons and idols, okay? Now, Nobody can say by the Spirit of God that Jesus is cursed. If somebody is prophesying over there and they're talking about that, you know they're not from God, okay, Corinthians? And again, he's talking to first century Christians right there in Corinth. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And then he says this. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. 
there are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Now, I, I taught Sunday school a couple months ago when Carl was in Florida and it was bitterly cold here. So Carl, if you're watching this later, I just want you to remember that. He's downstairs with the kids. When we were going through Sunday school, we talked about how to like uh, study the scripture. Okay, what do we see here? There's some repetition here. Can anybody show, tell me, looking at for repetition, what do we see here? What are the things that are repeated up here? Different kinds, yeah, okay. There's different kinds, but the same. Different kinds, but the same. Different kinds, but the same. So Paul's trying to tell us something about that, right? Now, there's a little bit different in there. It's not repeated exactly, right? There's different kinds of gifts. There's different kinds of service. There's different kinds of working. So he uses three different words. There's different kinds of gifts, grace gifts, okay, but the same spirit. There's different kinds of service. That's where we get the word deacon from. There's different kinds of serving. That means to wait on tables, but the same Lord. So again, he's kind of doing a Trinity thing here, right? Different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. Different kinds of service, but the same Lord. Different kinds of working. That's the word that we get energy from. Energomaton is what it is in Greek. There's different types of energy, but the same God works all of them and all men. So this is something that is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There's difference diversity, and there's unity. As we look at the spiritual gifts, we're going to see this theme today of unity in the midst of diversity, and that's going to lead to interdependence. Can we say that again? Unity in the midst of diversity that leads to interdependence because we need one another in order to grow and thrive. Let's keep walking through the scripture. So there's unity, right? Different gifts, different kinds of service, Different kinds of energy, <clears throat> same spirit, same Lord, same God. Now to each one, again, he's being specific, the diversity. The manifestation of the spirit is given for what? What's the reason up there? Common good. Now, does that seem to line up with to build up the body and to serve one another? Yeah, yeah, it does, right? Okay, so there's a theme there. Spiritual gifts are not given for you to feel all cool about your gift. They're given to build up the body. They're given to serve one another for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another, the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. Do you see what he's trying to do here? There's different gifts. There's diversity. Unity around God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he gives them to each one just as he determines. Now again, we're reading divinely inspired letter from Paul to the Corinthians, answering their questions, okay? Talking about the gifts that they were dealing with and looking at, okay? There's diversity of gifts, There's a unity around the Spirit. And this is what it says. God, the Spirit, gives them to each one just as he determines. The gifts that you have, that I have, God looked at you and he said, this is what I want you to have. It's on purpose. You were created for a reason. Let's keep walking through this. The body is a unit, though it's made up of many parts. And though all the parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ, for we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jew or Greek, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Again, unity in the midst of diversity. Okay, now, question for you all today. Who here has a body? Some of you did not raise your hands, okay? Okay, so he's going to bring this analogy in front of us, okay? This illustration of how the body of Christ is like our literal physical bodies. This is something that we should all be able to relate to because all of us here have what? A body. There we go. Good job, okay? So the body is, body is a unit. It's made up of many parts, but it's unified together, okay? And, and then it says here, now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. And then he says this, look. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body. If my foot all of a sudden was like, man, that hand is so cool, it can pick up pizza so that Jason can eat it. 
ah, and I can't do that. Man, I just think I'm not a part of the body. No, they want it to cease being a part of my body, okay? And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body. Man, that eye is so cool. It can see all these cool things, and I can't do that. I'm just an ear. I only hear stuff. I must not be a part of the body. Paul says, no, no, no. It would not for that reason cease to be part of the body, okay? Meaning, when you look at your gift, you can't go, man, I'm not like that other person. I must not be important. I must not be a part of the body. Uh -uh, Uh-uh, uh-uh. Unity in the midst of diversity, interdependence, we all need one another. Every gift, every person brings something to the table that's important and is needed. We can't overlook anybody. You have a role to play. On the flip side, okay, well, let's keep going on here. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. This is a little bit different. The other word said God put them just as how he intentioned it to be. This one is he put it just how it pleased him to put it. The gifts God gave you, he gave you intentionally, and he gave it because it pleased him to give those gifts to you. And if we were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. I mean, like, how weird would it be if there was a body just of a bunch of eyes, right? And wouldn't it be a body, right? We all can't have the same gift. We're not supposed to. God gave us different gifts, arranged us in the body how he wanted to, because there's unity from him, diversity in the body. It leads to interdependence as we walk together in love. This is what Paul is saying, because you know what? The Corinthians were missing it, and we'll get to that in a little bit. And then on the flip side, so before we talked about, man, because I'm not a hand, not a part of the body. On the other side, the eye can't say the hand, I don't need you. You can't see things. You just touch stuff, hands. Get out of here. No, okay? And the head can't say the feet, I don't need you. None of us can look at somebody else and say, your gifts are important. We don't need you. No, 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 no. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with a special modesty. While our presentable parts need no treatment. So in here he's saying, look, no part of the body is supposed to be excluded and pushed out. Everybody has a role to play. Every part of the body, the physical body, has a part for it. Every part of the spiritual body has a role to play. None are more important than others. They're all given by God intentionally and because it was well-pleasing to him. Unity from one God, diversity in the body leading to interdependence. We need one another. This is what this verse says here as we continue on. God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it so that there should be no division in the body. So one of the reasons why there's different parts is God wants there not to be any division. And all the parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. There's a diversity in the body because there's different needs and we're created differently. And the idea is that as we do that, we realize there can't be division among us. And when one person, one part of the body is going through something hard, we walk with it with them. And when somebody is rejoicing or they're honored, we rejoice with them because we are one body together. One body unified around Christ. And now he says, now y'all Corinthians are the body of Christ. Y'all Christians at Skiff are the bodies of Christ. And each one of you is a part of it. Or each one of you is a member of that body. So we are part of the body of Christ, like the Corinthians were. And each part, uh, each one of us is a member of that body. And then he ends a chapter like this. And in the church, God has appointed, first of all, apostles, second of prophets, third teachers and workers of miracles, also those having gifts of healing, those able to help others, those with the gift of administrations, and those in speaking of different kinds of tongues. So he's saying, here's the different gifts that God has given there in the early church that were working, like the apostles were sent out, the original 12, okay, that they were sent out there. And then he says this, are all apostles, are all prophets, Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? And and when we looked at that in English, it could be like, well, hey, is this true? But if you look at it in the Greek, there's two ways to ask a question like this in a rhetorical sense. And the way that's used here is all aren't apostles, are they? Are all prophets? No, that's what he's saying. 
Not everybody has all the gifts. Not everybody has this gift. Not everybody has this gift. Not everybody has this gift, but eagerly desire the greater gifts. Now, I want to pause right here. Depending on what version of Scripture you use, this phrase may be different. At the end of this, when Paul's got done saying we're a body, we're interdependent, unified around Christ, we all need one another, no one's better than the others, and he says eagerly desire the greater gifts. That can be taken two ways. One could be, so be eager to desire the greater gifts. And let me show you in the most excellent way. Let me explain what the greatest gift is. Or the Greek is, is the same. It could be, but you all want the greatest gift. So it could be either way. It can either be this exhortation show you the most excellent way i will show you the very best way or it could be corinthians you all want the best gift but i'm going to show you the very best way and then it goes into one of the most famous chapters i think of weddings in first corinthians chapter 13 anybody ever heard this chapter in a wedding love is patient love is kind all that it is about love but this chapter is about spiritual gifts Chapter 12 is all about spiritual gifts. Chapter 14 is all about spiritual gifts. Chapter 13 is about spiritual gifts. Because he says, look, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but I have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and knowledge and I have faith that can move mountains, but I have not love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. You see, the Corinthians, they were enamored about the gifts they had and operating in them and being prideful about them. And Paul says, look, you can have the quote-unquote awesomest gift mix that, in your opinion, and if you walk in it without love, you're nothing. You're nothing. You can give your life to Christ as a martyr, but if you don't have love, it's vain and worthless. So let me show you the very best way. You want to walk in your gifts? Let me show you the very best way. Love is patient. It's long-suffering. It bears under the failings and sin of others. Love is kind. That word means beneficial or useful. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud or puffed up. It's not rude or unbecoming. And a really hard one, I think, sometimes for me, it's not self-seeking. I don't know if you're like me or not, but like I know, I often know my needs. I often know what I want, right? And it can be real easy to just be selfish because I know what I want, I know what I need, right? But that's not love. Love is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered when something, somebody does something that ticks you off, you don't just blow up. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, That word for love, it always protects. It has the idea of like a covering over. Love covers over a multitude of sins. It trusts. That doesn't mean love is gullible. Sometimes trust has to be re-earned if if a relationship has been broken. But love is looking at there. I seek, I'm hoping and trusting that God's gonna work in you to rebuild this. And love perseveres. It endures. It pushes through. Love never fails. So Christians at Skiff, as we seek to walk in our gifts, If it's not done in love, it's vain, empty, and worthless. If we want to walk in our gifts, we need to let God's love settle in us so that we live out of that. Because the gifts are given for the common good, to to serve one another, to edify each other. And you know what? One of the ways that we can seek to grow in this love, as I've often heard people say, we can say God is patient, God is kind. So I encourage you to meditate on God's love this week. Continues on. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For, what, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put my childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully now known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. So Paul says this, look, these gifts, Corinthians, that you're so enamored with, they're going to fade away. 
And there's kind of two ways that this passage hasn't been interpreted. Some have looked at it when the perfect comes, when the word of God is completed, those gifts will fade away, okay? And, and as we look in history, we see that there are certain sign gifts that gradually kind of faded out of existence. It's not the same as it was, okay? Uh, Peter used to like walk through the city and his shadow would heal people, okay? Paul, it's like they, they had like a handkerchief from Paul that, that sent out and it healed people, okay? We don't see that happening right here in our midst. The other way to look at it, okay, is that the perfection, when Christ returns, when the perfect comes, really almost all the gifts fade away. Because Paul says, look, now we see as in a mirror dimly. Back at, you know, right now, if you look in a mirror, you get a pretty good picture of yourself, right? An accurate one, right? For better or for worse, that's what you look like, okay? Back in the day, their mirrors were polished bronze, okay? So you got like a, a decent look, but I mean like picture bronze, polish, 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 and you're trying to get a good look at yourself. It's not, it's not exactly. He says, we look at it as in a mirror, dimly. But when the perfect comes, when, I think when Christ returns, then we'll see face to face. We'll be known just as we are known. But Corinthians, it's not about being all enamored about the gifts because they're going to fade away. And we've seen that in history. We've seen different things fade away. But now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Why? Here's how I look at it. Right now, we look forward with faith. We trust in God through faith. We don't live by what we see. We, we, we have to believe in the unseen. We have this sure hope of the eternal life that's coming. And we love one another. When Christ returns, when the perfect comes, our faith is our eyes, right? We see it. The hope, it's not hope. We have it. But we'll never get to the end of loving God and loving one another. So he says, Corinthians, it's not about being enamored by these gifts because they're going to fade away. And we've seen that in history. And when the perfect comes, it's not about how awesome you thought your gifts were or not. It's about the love God has for you and how you used your gift to love and serve others. And then he says this, he wraps up with this in the first verse of chapter 14. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gift, especially the gift of prophecy. So he says, look, you want to know the most excellent way, the very best way? It's love. And so the challenge is pursue the way of love. Okay, follow, that's not a strong enough word for the Greek word that's there. That word in the negative sense means to persecute, okay? Pursue the way of love. Make it your first and greatest priority to pursue God's love he's given you and to pursue giving that to others and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, okay? And when he says especially the gift of prophecy, the next chapter, he's, gonna, he's going to contrast prophecy and speaking in tongues that they were so enamored with and be like, look, prophecy's a better thing than tongues back in the day because people can understand it and it builds them up. So if we look at that kind of from our perspective, follow the way of love, pursue the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gifts that you can use to serve one another. And the heart isn't, oh, I want, I want this gift so that it's all about me. God, there's ministry to be done and I want to walk on the gifts you've given me to do the ministry that, that you have for me. And over the next couple of weeks, we're gonna dive into what some of those different gifts were and how they show up now. So what does this all mean for us today. Two things. Pursue the way of love, okay? And eagerly desire spiritual gifts. Now, how do we do that? Let me put up all these at once. Number one, I encourage you, I challenge you, this week, meditate on God's great love. If you want God's love to flow through you into others, then you got to let him fill you up with his love. So let him fill you with his love. One of the ways you can do that, read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 4 through 8. I've got a little um, postcard thing in your bulletin, okay? And you can say, love, you can read that every day. Love is patient. Love is kind. You can remind yourself that God is patient. God is kind. You can reflect on his love given to you through Jesus Christ. And God, will you imitate your love in and through me so that that's the basis of my life, okay? And then the part about eagerly desire spiritual gifts. Again, I said this last week. If this teaching stays in this room, it's not going to do anything. And I can't make you do it. So I encourage you, read through the passages from spiritual gifts. That will be on the next slide. 
and work on your spiritual gift action plan. I put that there in your bulletins as well. If you're watching online, you can go to the resources page on our website and you can download, um, download those documents. Your spiritual gift action plan, okay? This is something that you can take an active step to walk, work in and I want to walk alongside you. And then join us next week. Don't miss, one of these, don't miss one of these Sundays. If you can't be here in person, make sure you watch it. It's important for us as we walk in this together. And then two quick things, not up here. Who do you want to invite along the journey with you? Whether they can come here on Sundays or they can go through the study together with you. And as we think about who to invite, be praying, God, who in my sphere of influence do I need to invite for Easter Sunday here on, on April 17th? Who needs to know the good news of Jesus Christ? Because you see, we're a loving, growing, going church. And we want to be all about the love of God shown through Jesus Christ. And up here, here's the passages, the main passages on spiritual gifts. So uh, if you want to, I mean, all this is in the Bible app. You can take a picture of that too, if you want to, um, so that you can go through those passages. Because you see, if you're a Christian, you have been gifted to serve. That you may be unleashed to walk in the ministry that God has for you and for me. So let's take a little bit of time to pray as we reflect on this, and then we'll transition into communion. Lord, we thank you. God, I, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you for the privilege and responsibility you've given us that you want to work in and through us. You've given us ministry to do. You've created us for that. You've gifted us to do that. So God, will you show us how you have, will you show us how you've gifted us? We show us opportunities that we can plug into what you're doing here at Skiff and in our families and communities and schools and work, Lord God. We want to be people that are actively walking in the ministry that you've given us. So God, we ask for wisdom and clarity. God, we ask that you help us to be equipped. God, will you show the passions that you put inside of us? God, will you help us be willing to step out of our comfort zone? In your name we pray, amen.